Hello, welcome to the TIFO Football Podcast. I am JJ Bull. I am hosting the podcast this week. So you can switch off now if you would like. Today I am joined by the the magical John McKenzie. Hello. Hello, John. That was my magical. Yes. <laughs> and now that there's magic in the air. Because we are joined also by Ruben Pinder. All right. The new boy in the office. <laughs> We're, We're just still using keeping that you. going. Yes. Yeah, okay. Well, I'm not doing yeah. the baby thing that yeah, Joe no, did. Yeah, that was weird. Yeah. Uh, hello, how are you? Fine. Good. So today we spoke about Brendan Rogers. <laughs> He's been sacked. Did you know that? I know you did, because you talk about it. And then there's also um, a lot on um, Graham Potter, because he was also sacked. Lots of sackings coming up. Uh, Crystal Palace, Roy Hodgson replaced the sacked Patrick Vieira. And we're good again. Yes, Crystal Palace, very a good. Yep. A sack, a sack, a sack, a sack. Oh, that's good. Oh, that is good, John. Well done. Thanks. Worst chant in football, by the way. But And joke. we find out where that phrase comes from, getting the sack. That's something we learn. We are educational on this podcast. So you learn about getting the sack. And then we do a bit on Manchester City versus Liverpool and look at the gap that's emerged between those two teams. Because they both used to be very good. And now only one is. Why? And then we asked, would you allow sentient crows into a football match if they had a ticket? Aren't crows sentient? They are sentient. They're just not... They're, they're alive crows. This is what producer Steve's written you see here. I think what he means is if it's... We're anthropomorphizing the crow yes. as though it were a human and could enter a I stadium. speak language. Yeah. That's the main bit. Would they, could you let animals into stadiums if they're not with an owner, but they were presenting themselves as humans? <laughs> is that, is the, sentient means able to perceive or feel things. So I'm guessing if you weren't sentient, you wouldn't want to go to the football because it'd be a waste of time. Well, maybe you, maybe you can't feel things and you want to go to football to see if you can, and that's the reason <laughs> what it is. That's just us. <laughs> Do crows have feelings? Find out later. The top four race featuring Brighton and Brentford, Pacey Pacey Newcastle, and a stuttering Manchester United. I should have done it like this, stuttering Manchester United, like um, The Who would have done. Roger Daltrey would have done that. Although Pete Townsend said that he wrote that stuttering bit. Did he? Daltrey says it was him. These are all facts about the Who. And then we have a very quick tour to Naples and Munich. And that's what we do. And if you'd like to learn even more about football from around the globe, like a real pro, someone like John McKenzie, you can read The Athletic. And if you go to theathletic.com forward slash TIFO, what happens, John? You can find lots of inf interesting information. For example, our good friend, Dr. Mark Carey, is at it again, I'm afraid to say. But he's just put out a piece on why... Um, well, <laughs> well, I guess in the Premier League... It sounds like you're implying he's done something nefarious. <laughs> he's done something nefarious. Yeah. Um, he has written a piece about back post scoring, oh, which yes. is something we made a video about with Mark Carey on t 4 So do check that out as well. Yes, please do. That'd be lovely. You can check out... Um, if you're watching this on the on the YouTube, then you already know where you are. But if you just listen to us, go visit t 4 on the YouTube. That'd be very useful. We'd like that, wouldn't we, Ruben? We would indeed. More numbers, please. More numbers? Yeah. Is that all you think about? Yeah. What else do you think about? Nothing, just numbers. Sharks? No, not not. When big, was the last time you thought about sharks? Um, probably when I was watching, uh, is it Step Brothers? When they're like, not allowed to watch the TV, and they're like, but it's Shark Week. Probably that. Do you know, I was at Brighton Good this film. this weekend. I went to a stag do, and uh, I've never been to Brighton before, so I took myself off to have a walk along the beach. And I was walking along the beach, and there was a headless shark <laughs> on the floor. And I was like, ah, oh, that's a shark. And I walked past it, and I was like, ah, oh, it doesn't have a head. And um, yeah, so I thought about sharks on Saturday. <laughs> How big was it? It was about this big. It wasn't a big, it wasn't oh. a big one. But... Where had its head gone? Uh, I don't know. I presume it had been eaten by something who then decided they didn't like the taste like of it. A hungry, hungry shark. seagull. Yeah. If you know where the shark's head is, <laughs> write us at the shark head <laughs> at tifo.com. <laughs> That's right. Do we have that email address? <laughs> it's it's going to send us a shark head now. <laughs> I don't like where this is going. Yeah, well, anyway. it's got to be somewhere. Mm. Unless someone's eaten it. You ever think about this, right? So if you eat something, it's gone, and it's inside you. It's gone now. So like you think of a, <laughs> think of a loaf of bread, right? Or a baguette, a baguette of bread. Now, if you eat the baguette, where does it go? It's just in you. Do you know when <laughs> I was... Did you do biology at school? <laughs> do you know... <laughs> when I was young, I, went, I was in France for... Look how France. heavy it is, and then it was gone. I was in France for France 98, 
and we were in Paris and I didn't really know what was going on because I was much younger back then. Um, but I, I have a, an abiding memory of England, England fans walking past us and a guy seeing a baguette that had been abandoned on the floor, picking it up and going, um baguette, um baguette, um baguette. <laughs> It was a very formative moment for me. It's not quite the... Um, where was he from? Was it an, an Irish fan on uh, French TV? Like they were doing a news report um, and the guy just peered behind the, the news guy and just went, Je suis un baguette and walked off. <laughs> Do you remember? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, it was class. Like if you drink a whole two litres of Coca-Cola or something like that... It's inside you, yeah. How, does it make you as heavy as the cola? Yeah. That's nuts. And then you break it down and you flush it out. And you go again, in the famous words of Stephen <laughs> Gerrard. So anyway, that's some of the things that we've talked about the nonsense now. And now what we can do instead is leave you in the cool hands and warm embrace of... A headless shark. A headless shark. <laughs> <laughs> in a sack. Sackings. Let's start with the latest sackings in the Premier League this season. We've now had 12 sackings. 12 sacks over the heads of, <laughs> of men in the Premier League. A record. Did you know that? Graham Potter has been put in a sack. It felt like he may have weathered the sacking storm, though, at Chelsea. But a 2-0 defeat at home to Aston Villa was the moment the Todd Bowley project, <laughs> definitely a name of a band, decided <laughs> Graham Potter was no longer their man. Chelsea nil, Aston Villa 2. Um, we've been talking about Potter being sacked basically since he was hired, John. So why do we think it has now actually happened? Well, I think there's a combination of things, isn't there? It's not they keep losing games, not looking great, which is yes. <laughs> never a good sign for a manager, and and usually will result in being sacked if you do that enough times. Uh, but also, Julian Nagelsmann is now on the menu. Um, <laughs> they're they're going to eat Nagelsmann. They're going to eat Nagelsmann, My and word. when that kind of thing comes up, then you quickly get rid of your coach, so he doesn't see what what it is that you can do to managers. But I, I, it does feel to me as though that's maybe what's precipitated this, that, that, that a good manager has come on the market at this point of the season. And I think everyone's probably going to be panicking about who is going to end up getting him. But I think Just that? Just you think it's mostly because of that? Type it's of not thing? mostly because of that. I think there's all of Waves, Hands, everything else that's happened mm. with, with, with Potter. And I think it's, it, it's a shame. But I think the big question with Chelsea is always going to be how much of this was down to Potter and how much was down to the madness of, of what's happened at Chelsea this season. Ruben, the big question is how much of this was down to Graham Potter and how much of this was down to the madness of Chelsea? <laughs> it's a bit of both, isn't it? It's one of them unanswerable questions where it's easier to... I'm afraid manager. you're going to have to answer it. 60-40 uh, <laughs> chaos Potter. Um, there you go. Uh, <laughs> but it's like it's always easier to just change a manager than... Chaos you know, Potter, this, of like... course, one of the least favourite characters <laughs> in the Harry Potter series. <laughs> <Yeah>. Chaos <laughs> Potter. Yeah. It's um, a less good name for a band, I think, Chaos Potter. Yeah, yeah. but the, he had a massive squad. Like There were so many bad decisions that weren't his fault, but it, as, as John said, like the, they weren't improving. So like there's one thing, giving a manager time, which they obviously intended to do, but if you're not seeing little gradual improvements and you are just losing games that you should win and kind of embarrassingly so, then it, it did become untenable. But th there's also the factor that, now I don't know whether this is uh, legit and whether there was this clause, but this is the first time they've dipped into the bottom half of the table. And Chelsea, um, as reported by The Telegraph, don't have to pay his full severance package, which would have been something like 50 million quid. So those two things could be connected. There could be like a clause where now is the moment to sack him cheaply rather than very expensive. Because he brought a whole massive team as well, didn't he, of coaches, and they've all stayed, so... Yeah, and then he's he's helping them out. I can't remember the phrase they used, mm. but he's basically just been like, all right, on you go. Yeah, this the, the phrase used was that he's been very professional about things. He um, seems like a professional man. I think so, yeah. He seems like a nice guy, and he seems like a... That was a problem. Yeah, too, too nice. nice. Well, well I wonder if it actually is a problem, because whether he doesn't have the, the air of authority that certain other managers do. He, doesn't, he certainly doesn't talk like a... Uh, in certain interviews I wonder whether he doesn't talk like a, a big manager because he just accepts that some things that's just the way it is which is quite refreshing but maybe some players need to be talked to a different way and I wonder John because you've coached teams before um, what are the difficulties with having 400 players because <laughs> when you're trying to set up a session right, you, you adapt it to how many players you've got so there, apparently they've had sessions where there's an 11 v 11 on one pitch and then like a 9 v 9 or another. And yeah, I mean, I think it's I think it's really tricky, actually. I mean, you say I've coached teams. I coached at a very low level. I coached at university that level. But counts. even in those situations at the university level, we would have a squad of about 15 players for a, for a game. And you would drive for 
you know, an hour, an hour and a half to a game and you're taking three subs or four subs, whatever, and you may not use one of them, in which case you're essentially taking someone away from a pretty busy university schedule to justify taking the day off to sit on the cold sideline in a pitch in Loughborough. Um, and those decisions were hard and, and people got pissed off in those situations. Now, if you if you then speculate towards where Graham Potter was, where he's got a squad of about 40 players, all of whom should be starting for Premier League sides suddenly you have a, an even bigger problem on your hands, which is you've got a group of players who all expect to play because they are elite players. And so um, no doubt that was that was, that was was pretty difficult for him. But is he getting the most out of that squad of players? Like, is what he's done at Chelsea since he's been there, sure enough, all these guys have come in, very difficult to gel a squad like that. I'm sure a lot of people can, you know, feel em- uh, sympathy for, where, for what he had to be able to do. Mm. But they were, like, they were terrible against Villa, weren't yeah, they? Yeah, they were really bad. And there's issues there's still issues with the squad somehow like they only really have Mm. well they have like three proper wingers and they don't really play a system that I don't know they don't have a proper number nine Um, Mudrick is taking a while to adapt Pulisic's not that good Sterling's injured like there are lots of these little things Jao Felix coming on loan is he going to stay who knows and there's like you know loads of defenders that never play and all that stuff but you still think given the 11s that he was putting out they should be they should have been performing much better than they were. So, and, and there was the other thing, like given uh, just on the note of like the whole managerial aura and, you know, keeping everybody happy, there was that classic old line reported that some of the Chelsea players had to Google who he was when he got appointed. It's like, that, though, yeah. he, he's, been play, he's been managing in the Premier League for three years. Like, surely you should know that. But maybe that's just more like symbolic of a general, really, this guy attitude from the players, which if they have that from the start, then you're kind of doomed. From the Having said that, on. though, I do feel as though the the game that when they, they came back against Dortmund in the Champions League, I felt as though the players made a really big show of being happy for him that, that they had done that. And mm. I don't know, I'm always a little bit... I'm always a little bit funny when we start doing like psychological explanations yeah. for why a manager has failed when actually I think, I mean, that obviously comes into it. And I think, you know, maybe if he'd been a, a, a high powered elite manager, as we think of them, it, it would have gone slightly different. But if you actually look for me, if you look at the trajectory tactically for what he did, he came in, tried to do the stuff he'd been doing at Brighton. It didn't work. They brought a load of players in, in January and then he went back to just playing a really basic 4-2-3-1 style. And that didn't particularly work either. And then they just went back to playing the 3-4-3 that they'd played mainly under Thomas Tuchel and if we go back to Tuchel with the exception of the Champions League which I realise is a probably a stupid thing to say um, because because a Champions League trophy is obviously important but I, you never get the got the impression that Tuchel's Chelsea tenure was like super uh, effective and 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 productive and I feel as though the problems that Thomas Tuchel had and he tried to solve them and eventually ended up just using that 3-4-3 system is where Graham Potter ended up at he was sort of like well as you said like I don't have the ability to be that flexible here. We've got to, we've just got to go back to playing this back three with 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 wing backs and um, yeah, like you say, maybe issues with with finishing, which we can, I'm sure we'll go on to talk about because I think that's a an interesting aspect of Graham Potter's clubs anyway. Um, but it just felt to me a little bit like Ch- the problems with Chelsea are endemic to Chelsea, and we've seen the same problems with the last manager and this manager. Maybe maybe bringing in a new manager will change things up, but for me, a lot of them come down to, as we said, personnel. The fact that that Todd Bowley has basically ripped everything out of of the club, and and the, there seems to be a, you know everything. There seems to be a level of madness there, but but also the fact that the squad just doesn't seem that functional. You can't really come in and and and, and getting in a super tactical coach is all well and good, but if you don't have the pieces that you need to be able to be flexible, then it doesn't really add. Yeah, to anything. I think if you ask ten people to name their on paper, like their best Chelsea eleven, they'd have probably all come up with a slightly different team because there's just so many different players there. Yeah, that... mine would look totally different to what Potter's been playing. Yeah, what would you change? Well, first of all, I'd try and get Mudrick like to his right position on the far left, and you want to get Felix into positions where he can do a lot more with the ball. Uh, but th- that that missing number nine is huge because you can't pin defenders back. You've not got someone in the box to aim for. Um, that is like the squad's good, but he is missing key bits and pieces. But then that said, the team against Villa is a back three, and two of the back three are fullbacks. Reese James mm. is what, like, the best right wing back in the world, I would say. And then you've got um, Kukurea, who, who is, is the opposite. <laughs> Kukurea is so mid, as the kids would say. He's just so bang average, and he cost like £60 million, pounds, didn't he? Yeah. That was bad. Well, do you think Graham Potter's reputation has been damaged by his time at Chelsea? Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think so. I, I, I think. 
I don't want to sound as though we're just sort of apologising for, for Graham Potter because I think there are things that have been done badly by him um, and this isn't and by any stretch of the imagination I was saying, oh, you know, it's just the club and he had no chance of making things better. But I feel as though um, th there's been a lot of conversations, I think, this weekend about underperforming expected goals because Graham Potter's teams always seem to underperform expected goals. And there's people out there making explanations for why this might be the case, particularly in terms of the way that, that Chelsea are trying to attack. But again, to, to bring it to Tuchel, I feel as though Tuchel had the same problems. I think both of those managers are really good at, at, at doing all of the build up from the back, move the ball down the field, get it to the final third. Um, but I think they're both so, they're, they're both so ponderous in their build-up that you end up with giving opposition teams plenty of time to structure their defences in the in the box for those moments and I feel as though um, we saw that a little bit with Tuchel, we saw that a little bit with with Potter and I think I would have liked to have seen him try to to identify that problem and and change it um, so yeah maybe maybe my criticism of, of Potter would be tactically would be that but in terms of going forward I think he'll probably get a better job than people think Next. But where do you think he'll go, though? He what? could he could very easily end up at Tottenham, right? Could be Spurs, yeah, yeah. Leicester, yeah. maybe, yeah. I yeah. think he'll. I think he's got enough credit in the bank to to be able to get like a, another Premier League job, not not an elite job. But I, I also think that he's probably he he would probably be okay going somewhere on the continent. Um, he's he's already got the experience of, of managing in another country. And Does he speak any other languages? I don't know. Probably he was in Sweden, wasn't probably. he? For a while. Oh yeah, likely to have spoken English most of the time now. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't mind him at Palace. There'll, there'll be a vacancy there. You just got Roy. Right. I wouldn't yeah, mind him a short term contract. I wouldn't mind him at Leeds either, yeah. to be honest. But, but the, think, the XG thing, like where his teams always underperform their XG and can't finish, it at Brighton it was like, oh, well, they've got Neo Mopai up front, so that's why. Hmm. But now it's like, they also, as we've just said, Chelsea don't have a prolific clinical number nine. But. It is is it more of an issue than like because were we excusing it at Brighton and now it's like or maybe his teams actually can't finish because as you alluded to the de defensive team can like park their team in their box too quickly because they're too ponderous and then the chances while they have high xg value because they're like close to the goal of in a very crowded area which makes them less likely to go in yeah exactly so it's yeah I know exactly what you mean that makes sense I'm pretty sure they were overperforming their expected goals at the beginning of this season before he moved on to Chelsea um, I don't know if was he playing Evan Ferguson back then I don't know if he's, he was starting him at that point but I mean I'm, I'm not sure but he feels like a deserve um, yeah he does a bit um, out of nowhere. Mm. I guess Matoma was 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 being played fairly early on as well right but I'd have to dig into that but I mean I think there's always interesting arguments to be made about why you might be consistently underperforming your expected goals um, I, I don't think a lot of people have done the actual legwork required to show why that may, might be the case so there's been some interesting threads made over on Twitter this this weekend trying to explain why that might be from a tactical point of view but I think what I would want to see is a little bit more um, examination of the numbers behind that to see whether or not it is just because it, I mean it's what it's, it's, he's got about four or five seasons data now where his teams have consistently massively underperformed their expected goals I think Chelsea this season are about uh, pushing eight goals below where they'd be expected to be so there's clearly something that's going on there there's also this strange factor which is probably quite harsh to judge Potter for this because he was doing brilliantly with Brighton like objectively he did very well there but yes. they've got even better since he left when Deservey came in that so, often happens, doesn't it? They can build off the back of someone else's yeah. ideas, and then you add a bit more. Maybe Deserby's done that. I suppose it should be more praise for him than criticism of Potter. I don't know. Maybe it's a bit of both. I mean, one of the things, like, because you, you've both said you'd have him at your club, I and mean, I think we all agree that he could definitely go to <laughs> somewhere decent, just maybe not. Like, Chelsea's a bit of a wild one just now, and I'd pr he probably wouldn't think he'd be on the same level as Jurgen Klopp or Guardi. He's not that sort of level, but very few people in the entire world are. Um, but one of the places he could definitely go would be Leicester, who now also don't have a manager because they put him in the sack. <laughs> they they now live together in the sack. Uh, Crystal sack Palace race. with all of those. The winner gets a Spurs job. Put them in a sack race. <laughs> yes, they well they have to it's they have to eat each other to escape the sack. <laughs> oh, they're in the same sack. Yeah, it's a real it's a dog eat dog world or a manager eat manager world. Then that was exactly what happened down at Selhurst Park. You guys. <laughs> Crystal Palace 2 Leicester 1 oh, now that was Brendan Rodgers' last game as Leicester City manager because uh, as we said we put him in the sack afterwards but Ruben you were there and we'll talk about Palace in a second 
But what did you make of Leicester? They are inexplicably terrible. Um, <laughs> I, a uh, former colleague of mine, Leicester fan, has been asking for Rodgers to be sacked for about a year. Mm. And I never really got it, like, why they were so bad, because, like, he's a fairly accomplished manager. They've got some decent players in that squad. Ricardo Pereira came off the bench. Don't know why he doesn't start. Um, but, you know, there's, there's talent in the squad. But, um, yeah, they were just so passive. Like, really, they let us have something like 20 shots in the first half. Um, which is, and then we ended up with 31 in the whole game, which is more than we had in the previous four games combined. Where were the shots from? Is it from close range or are they shooting from, because I saw that stat and I was like, where are these, where are they shooting Yeah, from? they didn't, I mean, they didn't add up to a great number of uh, like XG, but um, but they, they were, you know, they were kind of edge of the box, just inside the box, few bodies in the way, you yeah. know, Decore had a just out like sort of 20 yarder that started keeper's palms. Um, they were like fairly threatening. They, we weren't just like pinging the ball from wherever. Um, but yeah, they were just inexplicably really, like passive is the only word I can think of really. Um, so yeah, they, they're, well, they're can just you, terrible. Can you improve on that, John? We saw them play against Brentford the other week and they seemed fine-ish. No? Remind me of the score in that game. 2-2, two, two, was it? 1-1. One, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I mean, you watch Leicester and, and I think whenever you've watched Brendan Rodgers' teams in the Premier League, it was just very solid stuff, isn't it? I think for a long time he, he had this 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 mantra of uh, at home we'll play in like this 4-2-3-1 shape that will be our more attacking shape and away from home we'll drop into a 3-4-3 three, three shape which will be our defensive shape. And it seemed that seemed to be about as as complex as it got really. Um, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm pretty low on Brendan Rodgers, maybe, maybe too low. Um, so take what I say with a pinch of salt. But um, I was just looking back over his managerial career and he feels to me like quite an outdated coach in many respects. Um, and what I mean by that is it feels as though he was a, a guy who would be solid. He, he, would, he would be a solid, he would t coach a solid system, but would rely on individuals within that system to be to be good. Do you know what I was thinking? It's, it's similar lines, but it's almost as if like, when the generation of German managers came along and that became a lot of focus on transition, like it's all cyclical, right? But when that happened, his methods then were slightly further behind the, the, yeah. the generation before. Because you look through his career, he was always playing like 4 4 2 and diamonds and stuff. And then at Swansea, opened up and made it 4 3 3 and started playing yeah. a more expansive kind of game, like the possession game. Um, but like I, I interviewed a load of footballers who played under him to find out what they liked about Rodgers, what was good, and all of them said that his training sessions were amazing. And he came through Chelsea's, uh, I think he was a youth coach, yeah. and then uh, I think Mourinho really liked him. But he was uh, he's part of this new wave of managers who did, um, it's like tactical periodization, everything done with the ball. Yeah. So everything's done that way. And they all loved it, everything he did. This one, I think Joby McEnough said there was not a single session they did twice. It was always new every single time. I think, how'd you come up with all those? So it's just fun then more than anything. Right? Well, and then when that runs out, yeah. so like, his Liverpool team was really good and they very nearly got like won that title. I feel as though like out of possession systems now have got a lot better and I feel as though in that kind of world, he maybe doesn't have as many solutions as, as as he did before. But if you if you look back over the clubs that he's been at, so we talked about Liverpool, and and obviously Liverpool weren't the Liverpool of now back then, but they were still one of the the bigger the clubs in 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 England. He then goes to Celtic as well, right, where he has a massive financial advantage, and for the most part, Rangers weren't in the league when. Yeah, he was there, well, they had like sixty nine games unbeaten in a row, yeah, yeah, which sure. is quite good. But. Yeah, no, ov obviously, but I, I mean, I guess you would expect that from a coach who was. I think half of the old firm in in wherever division Rangers were right, but I, again he then comes to Leicester where they've had all of the successes of the of the, the the Premier League win and the Champions League performances where they did quite well, and he, he's taken Leicester from being a team who were challenging for the Champions League and were very close to getting it, but in his first couple of seasons to a team who now become a race, relegation battler, and I think that counts for something, right? It, it's <laughs> They won an Is FA that his fault though? He won an FA Cup. They won, yeah. And he probably should have gone after that while his stock was really high. Yeah. Well, not immediately, but like sooner after that. Ah, but maybe you think you can kick on. And yeah. like, the thing is, this um, the, the fall from Leicester going down to this lower half of the table, is it is it Rogers' fault? Has he not been backed financially though? Because they, they haven't... That is a big they, part of it. That is a I big think part of it. he has been backed financially until recently. Yeah, it was It, it, was, was, it was when they summer. hit the pandemic, right? They, 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 yeah. Their owners struggled because... 
because of the, the way that his business was structured. Some of their recent signings have been horrendous, though. Well, Rob Tanner did a piece in The Athletic, and he says that the club are putting the brakes on spending under Rodgers, having registered a record net outlay of £55 million pounds of five players during the 2021 uh, transfer window. So they needed to bring players in. They brought in Bubakari Sumare, Patson Daka, Yannick Vestergaard, Ryan Bertrand, and Adamola Lukman. Like, I don't think his signings have ever... Like, he's not really made that many good signings at Leicester. Yeah. Lukman. Lukman. He's a Leicester player. Well, on loan. At on loan. Atalanta at the moment. Um, oh, they brought him in on loan at the time. Uh, yeah, I think right, so. Okay. But uh, He is still a Leicester player, is, is he, he not? I'm not sure. Well, maybe he's maybe fine. Atalanta have signed him full-time now, but... He's, but also, he's also absolutely tearing it up in Serie A right now, Adamola Lukman. Uh, ironically enough, of that list, he looks like... The, the one good signing. Right? Okay, he, he went to he went to Leicester on loan and from, went, from Leipzig, 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 and now he's a Atalanta player. Yeah. So he's so they bought him Atalanta. Yeah. yeah. Well, he's had to replace the spine of that team if you think about it, because uh, Kasper Schmeichel's gone. Um, obviously, the team he took over, Wes Morgan, was on the way out or was already just not there. And then um, Johnny Evans, Johnny Evans, and Permanent Jimmy Vardy. Vardy. Yeah. So they've missed that whole middle of it. Telemans is not quite the same player uh, he was before. Harry Maguire. Indeed, he's not the same player he was. Is it the coach's fault? Is it that Leicester's players come down? Or basically, are Leicester at the end of this lovely arc they were on? Because they won the league, then they've got pushed in the Champions League, and they've sort of come back down to where maybe they should. Isn't end it up. the case that like the success that Brendan Rodgers has at Leicester is, correlates very strongly with the, the decline and fall of Jamie Vardy? Um, and then does that come back to the situation we said before, which is like he'll coach a solid system, but he will rely on individuals in that system if he's not very good at the recruitment side of things, which looking at that list of players suggests it might be the case. I don't know how much oversight he has over the I think people said players, similar things about him at Celtic as well. The players he brought in weren't, weren't amazing. Weren't good enough. Yeah. yeah. In which case, you know, it's it, it, we, t- we mentioned this the other other week, though. It's that it's the meme, isn't it? Like we're still trying to find the guy who's done this. I mean, at what point at what point does the book stop with him if, if he if he does have oversight? with the recruitment and now the team's bad well that's that's kind of on you is it relying on individual things that uh, thing kind of makes sense with his liverpool team as well because like they were brilliant but a lot of their goals were like individual magic from the two strikers right? Suarez is like one of the best players in the yeah. world at yeah time. right yeah. And, and he would score lots of different types of goals and they weren't like necessarily the same patterns reappearing it was kind of so you know Gerard ping the ball to Suarez and hope for the best so and it's Gerard Suarez storage and Sterling and, Sterling. Sterling. and Coutinho's in that team yeah. A, a good I mean, that league, sounds like team, quite yeah. a good good team to me. Yeah. It was a good team, yeah. Did have Skirtle and Flanagan in the back four, though. <laughs> so, Well, he still did well. Anyway, yeah. so that is Brendan Rodgers then, right? So maybe he's peaked, maybe he's done. Where does he go next? What level is he at now? Do we think Potter's not top four? He's below that. Where do we think Rodgers goes? I don't know. There seems to be... There's going to be quite a few good managers on the market this summer. Um I wouldn't surprise once they empty me the sack. if he ended up, yes, once they have poured them all out um, onto the market stall, uh, <laughs> whatever, whatever the wet metaphor we're, d- we're using now. I don't know where he ends up. Uh, a, a club, a different club in the bottom half of the Premier League. Exciting. West Ham, maybe, if they get rid of Moyes. How about Palace? Crystal Palace, yeah. because you saw them play. And what hope did he have against the mighty Roy Hodgson? I know. I mean, look, <laughs> if you're going to, there, there are lots of different reasons as to why Rogers was sacked, as we've just discussed. But the main one being, if you let Jean Philippe Mateta <laughs> score against you, you have to go. Um, Lovely goal. What was the reaction like to Mateta's goal? Because he's not beloved amongst the Crystal Palace fans. He's a bit of a cult hero because he doesn't score often, but he scores important goals. He scored a brilliant back heel flick against Brighton once. He scored against Millwall in the FA Cup. Those goals are going to make you very popular. And he's got a cool celebration where he like karate kicks the corner flag and everybody shouts boom. And it's really cringe. But, um, <laughs> I tell you, Luka Milivojevic isn't doing that, is he? He'd probably fall to pieces if he tried to karate yeah. kick it. Well, thankfully he's not playing. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was it was honestly magic. Like the atmosphere was really special, and um, you mentioned this about Reese Nelson's winner a few weeks ago. The noise the when noise. that goal went in because there was the collective, um, like, very brief moment of silence as he controlled the ball, and then a ver- and then everybody going, "Go on, yeah!" And it's just unbeatable. So yeah, it was great. Palace were genuinely like a completely different team. Eze was back to his best. Um, who like last time I was on I was saying he's not really had a great season he was just like unstoppable um, just needed love yeah and Roy Hodgson loves him like he actually because Roy Hodgson had Eze for a season never got Elise that was the changeover point right. um, but he he really loved uh, Eze that first season that he was at the club um, so he- yeah and like 
I've been very down on Palace this season, but and I don't mean to tempt fate, but I think everything's going to be totally great forever. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you feel as though you're safe now? Like, what's that now? You're on, thir- you're on 30, 30 points. Yeah, 30 yeah. points. Two, three more wins, we should be fine. Like looking yeah, at how bad so. everybody else is. It's amazing what like one result can do to the whole mood, but it's more the performance than a result. Yeah. We deserve to win that game about 5-0. Did you go back to 4-2 four, four, stuff? No, so you went... That This is the... When I saw the lineup, I thought it would be 4-4-2 four, four, with Eze kind of narrow left mid and Wilf kind of drifting out wide from attack. But it was just a really nice 4-3-3, Decore single pivot, Schlupp and Eze number, uh, number eights. And even Schlupp played well, which hasn't happened in a long time. Um, Elise and Wilf in their best positions. Uh, Wilf, unfortunately, had to come off injured. Did, um, did Mateta start up front? No, nah, he came on for Edward with about uh, yeah. five, ten minutes to go. And Edward actually played quite well. Um, some nice touches. He was a good player there. at Celtic, yeah. he was. Um, but like it, it was just like a team that made sense, um, a fresh positive attitude, which is kind of so. We basically we got the manager, we got the new manager bounce that we missed out on last time Hodgson took over because when he took over from Frank de Boer in seventeen eighteen, he actually lost his first three games and then won his fourth against Chelsea, which is why do you remember that press conference when Jose Mourinho was slagging off Frank de Boer saying that he lost seven games in a row? Sure. He didn't. He only lost four, and the next three were Hodgson, but. Um, yeah, so it's nice. It's a good time to get a new manager bounce right now. Well, um, Steve Hankey has very kindly uh, written or taken stuff from the internet telling us what the meaning of, the, of being sacked is. I always wondered why you say you're sacked. And this is what it is. According to the website History Extra, before the Industrial Revolution, when men, women and even children <laughs> flocked to the factories to make a living. This is written very dramatically. It was far more common for workers to travel from job to job. Labourers would move around on their own, carrying their own tools and supplies. The easiest way, children carrying tools, the easiest (laughs) way to lug their tools around was in a sack, which they would then leave with their employer for safekeeping. Once their services were no longer required, they were literally given their sack before being ordered to pack it up and leave. We used to be a real country. Mm. Yeah. So we could just like yeah, children don't do much work anymore, do they? Know, like, so that's the problem really with this country. Children don't do enough. Yeah, they're all playing on the Game Boys. <laughs> game Boys. When they should be lugging Give them their sack. That's what I say. I say they should be carrying tools always. <laughs> yes. We're gonna have a break now. Because <laughs> <laughs> nobody's got a chimney anymore. It killed the industry. Yeah. 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 I say bring back coal fires. <laughs> <laughs> that's where everything went wrong, wasn't it? The electrification of heating. Oh, we're back from enlisting children to carry tools around the city. <laughs> Manchester City 4, Liverpool 1. They were absolutely battered in this game, Liverpool. Man City were excellent. You said, uh, this, you said the scoreline correctly there, which makes me very happy. Yeah. Well, you I'm didn't just, do the Joe Devine. Uh, well, I'm not Joe Devine, and he wants us to be ourselves, yeah, well, and so I'll do I'm it. I'm just glad that he's been given the sack. I've only been here like a month, so I've been too scared to bring that up, but it really annoys me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I really liked it. I think it's funny. Well, I think it all started because Joe, to annoy Seb, would just read out literally what Seb says, you see, and that's why it's funny. In the same way that I will read literally what Steve says, because then it becomes a... I think it's like he's done this. This is really good, actually. Liverpool looked like they might put a spanner in the works for Man City, but that did not last. Um, so what happened in this game then, right? So Jota came back. That's useful for Liverpool. But uh, what, like, what happened in this game, John? I always find these games really interesting because I feel like whenever Man City play Liverpool, they always sort of end up playing very similar style of football to each other. And usually that can result in kind of really stolid 1-1 draws or whatever. Um, But in this one, obviously that wasn't the case. But yeah, it it felt to me that both teams teams were sort of building up in the same way. Both teams were pressing in the same way. So they both used a sort of 4-4-2 out of possession approach. But the problem was that that Liverpool got quite narrow in in their forward press and Man City were able to just uh, build up through them. There was lots of people talking about how there were similarities between how Man City were building up and what Roberto De Zerbi is doing. So people asking whether or not Pep is being influenced a little bit by by De Zerbi, which is fun. Um, but yeah, I, f- I felt as though Man City were... were really good at, at just moving the, the the Liverpool press around, making them really narrow and then exploiting the wide areas. So we saw Kevin De Bruyne and, and Gundogan on either side just dropping out in those build-up phases. And I think the first Man City goal, which was an exceptional goal really, was um, was was De Bruyne playing the ball through down the wing to Mares, who then switched the, switched the play. And then, yeah, it, it was just a perfect 
build-up goal where everything had to go right and they got, that, that got everything turn perfect. That Gundogan where he took it on his yeah, right one, and played and it on played it immediately, yeah. And Grealish's square ball was perfect, to be fair. It's like he made it look easy, but that ball can that very easily th- go wrong. So that second was that not goal? the equaliser? I think that was the equaliser, yeah. yeah. Oh, was it, yeah. First, the first goal that they scored. The Liverpool goal came from the fact that, that Man City were being really aggressive in their pressing, um, which is, I think, maybe an area where Liverpool fell down a little bit as well, uh, because I think that, that, that they... When you're, pl- when you're playing the way that Liverpool were playing with a the, with the 4-2-4 press and they were getting narrow, you then need your fullbacks to jump onto the wide players to make sure that you don't get uh, any any easy possession in those areas. Now, obviously, that's terrifying and Liverpool have been um, have been struggling this season from having, you know, aggressive fullbacks who, who then get exploited by the opposition. And so it felt to me like they were hanging back a little bit, whereas Man City, if you look at some of the phases of the game, they've got John Stones, who's playing as an inverted fullback, just jumping onto the opposition fullback. And actually for the for the, the Liverpool goal, you see Stones jumping onto, onto the fullback on one side uh, and then Aki jumping onto the fullback on the other. And they're just leaving two centre-backs and, and Rodri with four Liverpool attackers in front of them or around them. Uh, and so... Trent Alexander Arnold was just able to play that first time ball over the over the top and, and exploit that. And they tried to do that quite a bit in the first half, um, just getting behind the, the the aggressive Man City press. But the reason why Pep does that is because it gives you a huge amount of upside. You can control the opposition mostly and, and you're going to generate more chances yourself by turning the ball over than you are the opposition exploiting it by going in behind. So, yeah, I thought it was a really fun game. Um, and, yeah, the, Man City just seemed at that point of the season right where... They go a goal down to Liverpool and it doesn't phase them. They just keep doing what they're doing. They they dominate games. They'll occasionally give up goals here and there because of their aggressive style of play. But they're good enough to just score two or three more and make make no difference to it. So yeah, I thought it was a, a fun game. Well, uh, I also thought it was fun. I did a video on it after the after the match. You can see it on Tifo IRL where I broke down the whole thing with all the tactics and stuff like that. And one of the things I think is interesting about games like this is that. Although these managers have almost total control over what's going on, except for the individual decisions that their players make at certain times. And like the first goal that Liverpool score, like City are doing everything right, I think. And there's just a little decision that Aki has to make whether to jump to go and make that attack. Because basically they play it from the back and goalkeeper goes to Fabinho, who manages to slip it into Alexander-Arnold. And they're just, just skipping past the press, which is... Dangerous, but it results in a goal. So that's the, the good thing to do. Aki, like you say, uh, makes that decision to, to go and to get caught in the high line. But then the the goal that I think the equaliser for City, I think it is. In the first half, yeah. It's the one where the ball comes around to De Bruyne. So they, they start, the, the 4-4-2 press from Liverpool changes to more of a, the three because Jota comes round. Mm. And it leaves a little bit of space for De Bruyne around the side. And he turns it on round to Mahrez in the, the wide yeah, right. Because yeah. they're keeping Grealish and... Uh, and Mares always super wide, like touching the touchline to stretch that back lane. And then that's when Robertson makes the decision to jump when he should probably... I don't know, what do you think? Do you think Robertson should have jumped there? I can't decide what he should have done. Yeah, I, th- I think the reason why why City use their fullback, uh, wide players really wide is because is precisely because they want to pin the opposition fullbacks, right? And they want to generate space in between the, the wide... With a four, obviously, with a 4 2 four, press the space is going to be on either side of the midfield yeah. so if as long as you can keep that area free then you know roughly that in, if you're having any trouble with build-up you can find those wide areas anyway um city were pretty good at, at, at finding those those balls wide in pretty controlled areas as well but uh, interestingly i think the narrowness was what played what did for for liverpool so a really good that was a really good example of why you want to be getting narrow in your build-up in the central space i have an inverting fullback because it does pull those wide players in um and so you, what, what Liverpool were doing is they had the front four, they would push Salah onto, uh, the, they would have the two central players, so Gakpo and Salah sitting on the pivot players and usually Salah would jump onto the centre-back who was holding the ball. Um, as soon as he did that, whichever side had, well, it would, it would be Gakpo or, or Salah jumping onto the centre-back and whoever went, then the wide player would jump in to cover the, the pivot player as well. Um, but the problem then is you're leaving space in the in the wide areas as well. And the idea is that the fullback then jumps to cover that space. And I felt that the City were just really good at exploiting that. Um, and if you watch that game back, just th- their pivots always end up finding space because they know exactly when to drop out, when to uh, when to move in, in into a shadow, but be ready yeah. for the, the bounce pass across. Very similar to the things 
things that we see Brighton doing as well. Uh, and as a result of that, Liverpool's forward press just couldn't control anything. But I, I felt like the, the City just knew that they could drop out their two wide play, uh, the, to shoot eights into the wide areas, and they would there would always be a free pass on. Yeah. And it was it had really nice access to the those the Grealish and Mares as well in the wide areas. And so yeah, I think I think I, I don't know how, what I would have done if I was if I was Klopp. I think it's probably more of a case of the system or structure that he was using not working. Well, I was going to ask you this. I wonder if you agree with what what, what I took away from it was that I think City were deliberately trying to structure build up in such a way that they'd go to the right hand side of their 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 right hand side to then be able to target like a ball over the top through ball wherever they want. When you get further up the pitch, so maybe the final third or the halfway, you start to change the angle. Like in the past, like managers like Dean Smith at Villa said they, they went, remember when Villa battered Liverpool. Remember that game seven two seven two something yeah. like that. So like he said that what they notice is that they play they're very narrow out of possession. So if you just switch the play, you want to mm. switch the play constantly. That's what you do. But I think, as other teams are doing, as I want to ask, is whether is that what you think they're doing as well to then target Alexander Arnold specifically? I think balls on the top, or he's not. He's not. Yeah, I mean, I think it's. I think it's both. I think it's Robertson and Alexander Arnold, and I think that's because Liverpool are so reliant on their fullbacks in possession that they always just end up with a with the situational back three, and so we see that a lot. So if you can if you can get the ball in, for some reason they seem to sit. Trent Alexander-Arnold a lot deeper than Roberts at the moment. Um, but, uh, there's been so many goals this season where the, t- the opposition have targeted the space behind Roberts and when he's gone forward. Van Dijk comes across and then you've got, basically, Trent Alexander-Arnold becomes a second centre-back. And so if you can overload on that back post area, then you, yeah. can, you can have a lot of joy, I think. That back three as well keeps being that the right side centre-back goes over to cover the space mm. behind Trent Alexander-Arnold and then you've got so like Van Dijk is in the middle, obviously, then Robertson. But they don't play, they don't compact the space. They leave it wide open. And I can't quite figure out why, because to me, it, it looks like you have one centre-back at, at the time. Rather than three. Yeah. Rather than three. It is, it's so far split. And it's obviously a tactical decision to be made. And I can't make sense of it because it looks weak. Yeah, and I think it looks weak because usually in those situations, the opposition will have their back line and one or two of the centre midfielders dropping into that line as well. So again, it's because Liverpool play so aggressively, they end up in these situations where they le- they do leave themselves exposed to a certain extent. And the other thing that City were doing is they were they were abandoning the the, the forward line a lot with with Alvarez dropping in um, yeah. and and creating space for those those the two wide players to get in from from the outside as well. It was in in hindsight, it was very it is very Brighton under De Zerbi this idea that you do you sort of do slow central uh, slow central build up create space in the wide areas to then be able to decompress really quickly at speed, get your centre forward pulling pulling the opposition centre backs out and creating space for your wide players to get into. So yeah, I thought it was it was a fun game from that perspective. And then that thing as well, I mean, if you were a Klopp, say you're a big Premier League manager now, and you can see these things happening uh, and the City are getting a lot of joy in this. I mean, talk about Alvarez there, that little tactical bit, like he sets up one of the goals basically because he drops deep and then pings the ball over the top for the player running in behind. I think it's Grealish when he scores his goal and then De Bruyne runs into that exact space mm. we're talking about. It's there. What problems do you see Liverpool having defensively? What do you think needs to It's a change? tricky one, isn't it? Because every team does target the space behind Trent. And like for a long time, there's been discussions about can he defend? Does it matter if he can't defend? And when they were good and everything clicked and Henderson and Fabinho had loads of energy, it didn't really matter because he created enough goals. And now they're not as potent in attack for all these various fatigue reasons and whatever but he is being exploited so much that it's kind of becoming a problem that you can't ignore anymore. But then what's the solution? Because they don't have another right back in the squad. What are you going to do? Put James Milner there? He'll get burnt as well. well they have like, done it. Yeah. And he's such a good player. This is the, the, the eternal problem is that I think any defender is going to be in trouble if they're always ganged up on 2v1. Yeah, and if they're asked to attack like he is, like yeah. that much. But he attacks from a slightly deeper position now. Like mm. it is slightly deeper and you'll try and, I think you see his touch yeah. map, it is deeper. He's definitely deeper. And I, I said in that video that I did, I, I'm pretty sure he stays in line with Henderson or Fabinho, one of the two. He just stays in line with him so that's his re- reference point and then uh, partly because uh, Salah doesn't do as much tracking well it's the right it. side and Harvey yeah. Elliott I think is learning how to uh, defend at that level as well and especially in these high pressing situations and maybe he doesn't quite there. again with Salah like you've got the situation where in possession, Salah is dropping out onto the wide into the wide area because that's what he, li- he likes to pick up the ball up on the sideline and and run in on the diagonal. Yeah. Out of possession, Salah's playing in the middle, and so you, you so Harvey Elliott has to switch. Like Harvey Elliott is basically just having to cover for for Salah as well. So yeah, he was playing as the wide player in the front four, and Salah was going forward so you can sort of offset Salah's lack of tracking back. So you have Harvey Elliott in that situation. It does feel as though 
Liverpool have gone through a situation where they were able to be dominant because they could they had all of these weaknesses that that the system out of possession covered up. Yeah. And when you when you know that that's the case, you can be super confident going forward. I was I was watching the game back yesterday and the situations where Trent jumps forward to onto the fullback to be in an aggressive press, but you can see him chicken out midway through and he's like, "Oh, I'm going to I'm going to go back." And I think that's that's what's doing for Liverpool at the moment is that they don't have faith in their out of possession system, so that their 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 in possession system is so much less aggressive because they're terrified of giving the ball away and and then being counted on. So it's like both sides of the game negatively affected by the fact that that they they're less aggressive going forward, but they're also less aggressive out of possession. And so what's ended up is a sort of midpoint between the two, and it's a mess. Really, you can't half arse an aggressive press, yeah, can yeah, you? Exactly. Yeah. Well, it's it's. I wonder if a bit of it is that a lot of teams have figured out this group of players rather than just specifically the tactical system he's using. Like they just sort of know what's going to... They're so used to it now. But then like Klopp said, there are th- in his post-match, he was saying how um, there are decisions they were making and things they were doing that they just cannot they cannot be doing. Like They'll be trying to get that coached out of them. And so whatever reason it's happening. But City were amazing. And Guardiola said, I think it's either the best or one of the best performances he's seen in seven years. I thought they were absolutely superb. I love Jack Grealish. <laughs> yeah, we should, we should talk about super, Jack Grealish because yeah. he was great. amazing. And he's quietly put together like an incredible season. Like We went from last season where everyone... I mean, the beginning of this season, I made a video as like, why... Jack Grealish is perfect for for Pep Guardiola, and it was a controversial topic at that time. And I feel as though we've now gone from the situation where people are like oh, 100 million, but you can't even get onto the starting eleven. So him being one of the first names on the on the on the on the team sheet, but and then like with all City wingers, it was going to take him a year yeah, to yeah. learn the role, right? Because at Villa, it was like um, hero missions. I'll save the day. I'll dribble wherever I want. And the whole to, system was built around him. Yeah, and right. he's admitted as much in interviews. He's like, I didn't realise I was going to have to take in this much information and learn so many new things. And now he's kind of understands his role. And he also probably benefits from not having Joao Cancelo behind him. Brilliant player, but always trying to do the same things in the same spaces, mm. like right footers who cut inside and whatever. So, yeah, he's just learned his role. There's a, there's a moment trained. in the first half before... Uh, City equalise where I think Stones heads the ball loses the ball in transition and Grealish bombs it back for about 60 yards to make a, yeah. a block on on Salah's on pass Sal- yeah, yeah. and then he scores and then he assists Alvarez equalise yeah, like a minute other, later yeah at the other end yeah and I think that was sort of emblematic of, of just how far he's come on he's, he's, he, there were so many situations in that game where he is doing defensive work really deep on the on the left hand side as well and uh, yeah just a, a brilliant brilliant player mm. Steve's and- written it in so I'm going to ask it right but um City basically have two different teams, like one with Holland in it because they play in a certain way to get the maximum out of him and another when Alvarez plays because then you can do the things he was doing, like leading the press, which Holland also does to be fair. But then like that goal that Grealish scores where Alvarez drops in to play over the top is the kind of thing I haven't seen Holland do. Uh, so do we dare discuss whether one is better than the other? It's a silly argument, isn't it? Or is it? I've seen people argue that that in the league City should play this way with Alvarez, and in the Champions League they should play with. with well, this worked against Liverpool particularly with Alvarez. I think like would it have been different with Holland in the team? Yeah, it would definitely would have been different. I think, um, and uh, yeah, I think the fact that you can expose Liverpool on the break um, means that that having a player who can drop in to to make that front the, the back line of Liverpool even weaker is is going to be a dangerous approach. I still think that. Holland would probably they would have been fine with Holland in this. He'd game probably as well. scored seven in this game. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, who knows? Who knows? They'd have just um, been different types of goals, wouldn't they? Or, yeah, I, I, I think. Or somebody else would do it. Like, uh, yeah, I. It sounds he's f- amazing. It's ridiculous. Like, they scored loads it's, of goals yeah. with him. He scored like eighty already. It's yeah. It's just maybe doesn't quite look as fluid when he plays, but goals a goal and he scores loads of them. It's, so. it's definitely more one dimensional when when Holland plays up front, but you. You know the downside of being one-dimensional is that you have the best goal scorer who's ever lived playing. But it's a great field. dimension. Yeah, exactly. It, it's is a it the best dimension? Works, right, but but I, I think this is why people are suggesting in the league you might want to have a little bit more fluidity because you know in league games you're not re- really required to have just a guy who's going to bully bully goals necessarily. Sometimes it might be good to to actually have some kind of sustainability to the way that you're attacking. But um, whereas in a, in a knockout competition, it's it's you know, we've seen it with with Real Madrid over and over again. Just having someone who is going to score goals is is such a, a dangerous weapon. So I, I see I see the the arguments, but it, it's hard to, it's hard to argue, isn't it? When 
when the guy is the guy is just scoring so many goals. There's some games where right where you where City look like they're struggling a little bit, right? And and sure, like change thing up. But then you get these other games where he scores five goals, six goals in a game, and you're like, well, <laughs> are you calling him a flat track bully? But I don't think it. We've normalised uh, yeah, I mean, to accept. It is a flat. Yeah. He is a flat track bully in in many respects. But there's going to be some teams where that's good and and bad against. And I think the idea is like, why not use him um, yeah, with yeah. that in mind, right? It's just a nice problem to have, isn't it? Absolutely. And there are many problems to be had in the top four race because then you've got um, Arsenal and Man City obviously competing for that, that title race. And you see by this Man City performance that they're very much in that. But Liverpool are now below Brentford in the league. Uh, Steve's dying in the control room, if you've heard that. So Liverpool are now below Brentford and 42 points to Brentford's 43. Brighton and Brentford shared a, a lovely three-all draw, John. Uh, one of the two well-run clubs, the well-run clubs derby. Yeah, it wasn't that lovely, was it? It was quite spicy. I heard. Well, I didn't actually catch this. I am going to catch it at some point this week, but um, I saw that Brighton put up four point five xG, so they they were clearly playing well. Uh, I think that Brentford were really efficient, so they they scored a couple of set piece goals, which is always good to see. Um, Tony's finish was nice, as was Mitoma's. Hmm. That's my contribution to this analysis <laughs> this is excellent and I don't want Brighton to get into the Champions League but I fear they will why don't you want well, them to no, get into the Champions League um, because they are my club's arch rivals but um, no, they, everyone, everyone the knows the time old they're rivalry. like a hundred miles away aren't they <laughs> yes this is a nonsense derby and I'm it's sure like, lots of people love derby. it but what is it then it's a rivalry it's a rivalry based on history not geography oh okay well then I like it again yeah. <laughs> The, the, do you have a, if do you there have isn't a, there should be a, a TIFO rivalry? video explaining it like there probably I think is. there is yeah, yeah. and do, do you have a geographical rivalry is that Millwall Millwall Charlton but they're so far down the pyramid who is your geographical them. rival John but Mine, in real right life right now is it Henry you, it's you <laughs> <laughs> it'll be Henry later when I'm in closer proximity to him but yeah. Henry is uh, John's flat mate. mate yeah <laughs> you made that really big yeah, US then <laughs> I don't know. Is that what you call it? Flat mate? Yeah. We yeah. share a flat together. We share a flat, yeah. That's what you do. But no, they probably won't, will they? It will be um, Newcastle and either Man United or Tottenham. Brighton, are they better under, under De Zerbi? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're absolutely flying right now under De Zerbi. Does he deserve Zerbi more yeah, attention? I will love it and I think I deserve it. What's that? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I think, I mean... He's he's been the nerds' favourite for a long time, right? He started out well, started out at Benevento, I think, and they they got relegated, and he ended up at Sassuolo. But when he was at Sassuolo, everyone started watching him, getting excited about him, and then went across to Shakhtar Donetsk and uh, sort of disappeared from the limelight a little bit. Um, and then obviously the war in Ukraine happened, and yeah, he came came back to 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 the top five leagues, and I think has has maybe surprised people with how quickly. His ideas have been bought, bought into by by Brighton. I suppose, in, in many respects, Graham Potter laid the, the foundations for you know flexibility meant that that De Zerbi could come in and and have an impact. I guess I'm interested to see the long term uh, effect of 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 how teams respond to De Zerbi because one of the things that we've seen happening this season, I think, is um, you get sort of half season if you're playing well, then teams start changing the way that they're approaching you. So with with Arsenal, for example, I did a video on. On, on their defensive numbers changing after the World Cup. And I think a lot of that's come down to the fact that um, teams recognise that Arsenal are going to batter you if you do anything other than sit deep. And so teams are now sitting deep, which changes the way that the, 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 the dynamics of the game go. And so Arsenal can be a little bit more open from um, defensive transition, but that's because they're controlling games and forcing the opposition back. Um, Newcastle were sort of wobbly a bit, weren't they, after the after the after in the second half of the season? Teams started sitting deeper against them and it became about how they're going to break teams down. Um, and I think that with, with Brighton, once... Because I think they play in such a unique way, right? We've talked about Man City playing in this way, but um, doing this this really patient build up, baiting the opposition in, and then being able to generate space then where you can transition into. So usually with transition, you're you're doing that by giving the opposition the ball, sitting deep, and then hoping you turn it over and, and being able to break. Whereas what De Zerbi's trying to do is create those same conditions through build up play. So so building up deep baiting the opposition in, and then playing these really quick combinations that get the ball down the field, and then. Um, Doing yeah that, that abandonment of the front line, so getting your two strikers dropping quite deep, pulling the centre backs out, and then creating space for your two wide players to run into, being able to find them through through these uh, these patterns. It's really exciting, but I'm sure that you know when when it comes to the summer, all of the 
the uh, analysts at the various Premier League clubs will sit down and be like, right, what's the best way of trying to cause problems? What are their weaknesses? Uh, and it'll be interesting to see how they they weather those storms. But uh, even even now, right, there's different teams trying to find ways of stopping them in their build up phase, and they there is a load of flexibility in their in their build up. So, um, for example, Leeds. Um, were quite interesting. They they basically were really narrow. They they did a four two four press against them, so they had a, a, a front four around the the double pivot, and they were just re- they were not jumping in onto the centre backs at all. They were like happy to let Brighton centre backs hold the ball, and Brighton just got to a point where they're like, well, there's no point having two double pivots with like four Leeds players around them, so we'll just go to a single pivot and move the the other player out. And so they they definitely have solutions um, already in their build up phase, but I am interested to see like what happens when teams figure them out. Can you figure them out? Can Brighton be figured out? Well, Brentford almost did because they were leading until the very last minute. It was a penalty, I think, wasn't mm. it? Um, yeah, McAllister scored a penalty. Uh, and on Brentford, like they are, they're seventh. They should not be seventh. It's mental, isn't it? It's crazy. Uh, what do you think? Like, what do you think of Brighton here? Like, where, where, where do they get to? Where does this stop? Brentford or Brighton? Yeah. Brentford. Um, do you consider them to be a rival, either <laughs> geographically yeah. or historically? I mean, they are closer to us than They've Brighton, got the same first letter as well. Does that Brewer, come into it? The Brewer Brewer. Derby. Uh, yeah. No, I, I don't mind Brentford. They're very admirable. I mean, from a fan perspective, I'm just both very envious of both clubs. But, like, realistically, this is probably the ceiling for both of them, right? Because of just how much money the teams above them have to spend and the fact that Chelsea and Liverpool will eventually be good again. Um but they should enjoy it while it lasts because they've got uh, a nice a nice team, a nice stadium, and they play good football. And um, like, it, I just so jealous of them having like Ivan Tony. I, if you put Ivan Tony in like in the Palace team, we'd be infinitely better. Um, yeah, it's just I, I, I don't like how good they are. <laughs> <laughs> do, but do I'm, we, ha- I'm like you know happy for them. In it's a way, an interesting but. question though, isn't it? Like, do we think that Brighton and Brentford could break into the top whatever number we're calling? When it, it now? becomes a, the big eight, yeah. yeah but uh, probably uh, only when it's already other teams now, have a it? disastrous season. Yeah, like, you need other ones like like Liverpool like, are and Chelsea. Yeah. But I feel like, I mean we've, we've seen Leicester won the league. We've seen teams do it before, off, yeah. right? We've seen Leicester do it. They're a good example where they they sort of. They had a, a good season and they rode that for a few seasons and then dropped off. But given that Brent, Brentford and Brighton are always held up as being like smart clubs, do we think that they can do it sustainably? Because I think that's the thing, right? If they can sustainably be, you know, challenging for the top four, then they become de facto part of the top six, do they not? Isn't that, I mean, that's that's exactly what the, the teams who, like Chelsea, Chelsea and Liverpool aren't, aren't going to be challenging for the you would think the top four this season but we still consider them to be in the top six but that's because they've got lots of money I mean Liverpool are smart as well but like do we think that Brighton and Brentford can make up for the lack of financial clout or even maybe end up having financial clout because they are run by smart people no, it, no. Palace and Brighton <laughs> geographical <laughs> rivalry right? it's, not geog- it's not geographical no but this is a thing okay. right? there is actually only 45 miles yeah. between the Amex and Selhurst Park Yeah, that would take 4 hours and 50 minutes to cycle well uh, a, lot of, a, fast a lot of people do cycle it yeah and 14 hours to walk yeah which sometimes I want to go on a long walk but that is too far along the M23 <laughs> yeah <laughs> Okay, along see, interestingly, like Leeds' biggest rivalry is with Manchester United. Yeah. And I would consider that to be a dark maybe I wouldn't. Well, well but this it's is the fifty one right? miles, so it's 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 yeah. actually further away than Also uh, actually no, yeah, it is forty five miles to the Amex. I was gonna say the Amex isn't in Brighton, it's in Falmer, which oh. is a horrible little place with a very small train station. Well it's near Brighton to me. Yeah. So forty five miles and then you've got Brighton's south coast rival, Southampton are 68 miles away from the Amex. Mm. So... Actually, this isn't as the crow flies. Let me work that one out. As the crow flies. My favourite South Coast derby is... uh, Not derby, rivalry is uh, Plymouth Argyle and uh, Portsmouth Mm. have a bit of beef from many league encounters and playoff encounters and players going from one club to the other or whatever. And um, Plymouth fans, or sorry, Argyle fans, like to sing you dirty northern (laughs) at the Portsmouth fans because of their relative geography despite them both being on the south coast oh I see I like that pettiness the uh, mm-hmm. the air distance from Elland Road to Old Trafford is actually only 37 miles so I apologise but it, it's 50 miles if you drive if you, you or if you're to. a crow that goes to the football <laughs> yeah. if you're a really drunk crow <laughs> yeah it's much longer would they let a crow in I think they can get free admission can't they Hard if to a, stop. <laughs> bear with me now right <laughs> if a crow took on uh, the the mind of a human right so it was really smart this crow 
and it was walking. Have like you nicked this from Game of Thrones? Thrones? No, but if it was That's walking right. on its hind legs and everything, and it's just wearing a jacket, That's right? what they they do do that. So it's got, they walk it's on their hind legs. Five crows on each other's shoulders. <laughs> okay, would you let them into the game? Like if it comes in and has a ticket, you'd let it in. Yeah, the, most grounds are ticketed anyway, right? With with automatic ticketing, so that was it's, all, it's all e-tickets now, though. How are they going to carry a smartphone? Doesn't say people only, does it? It's so much easier for them to just fly over the top, though, JJ. Yeah. And then they should just do that. They can see all the games for free. I was watching Charlton back this week, and I don't know if you've ever watched Charlton recently, but they have a flock of pigeons which frequents their pitch in almost every game, and the, the pigeons move around. And, and you're like, oh, they're going to run into the pigeons, and the pigeons fly to the other end of the pitch, and then like two minutes later, when, when the other team transitions to the other end, they're like, oh, there's the, there's the pigeons. That do you know at Aberdeen, um, there's a hawk that they take out, because there's so many seagulls, so many of them. Oh, and they're so aggressive at certain times of the year when they have like baby seagulls. seagulls. Cause obviously, adult ones have baby ones. Um, the mothers are very protective, and they will swoop. I've seen the seagull uh, take an entire pie out of someone's hand <laughs> once. It's one of the funniest things I've ever seen. Really, he was in the like, stadium. Or was no, no, just no, walking around no. uh, near Union Street, the main street in Aberdeen. And there's a guy who had a pie like in the bag. You know, you have it in the bag, and he had the pie, and he's about to take a bite as you would like that. And <laughs> as he did that. <laughs> I swear. You saw that live in the flesh. I saw it. It was so oh, funny. No. Anyway, but they have a hawk to like, get rid of them, mm. and it works. They have an we, eagle. No, we don't anymore. I saw that eagle. Kayla. I don't know what it was called. It, she it, was called Kayla. Was, May she this rest was back, in peace. This was back in, Aww. I don't know when. It was when you were in the championship. I went to Selhurst Park for a game against Leicester. Leicester had Chris Wood playing, and Jamie Vardy and Harry Kane were on the bench for them. 12-13 promotion season, yeah. There you go. Mad. That's what it was. So there was a, there was an eagle back then. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, we had an eagle fly about before games from crossbar to crossbar um, as until 2020 when that eagle died. We didn't get a new eagle? No, we didn't get a new eagle. Uh, budget Disrespectful to Kayla. To, no, she's, we, we cannot replace her, you know, as Pep would say. So, um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, was, it was a lot of fun, though. And now we just... Yeah, just have like storms. Child labour and eagles. Like, that's what's wrong with this country. Yeah. Yeah. Just... Well, on that sad note, I think we should think of the eagle during this next break. And we're back. Newcastle United 2, Manchester United, Electric Boogaloo. They were uh, really well beaten by Newcastle here. Eric Ten Hag kind of laid into his players and said they basically the equivalent of the Newcastle wanted it more, had more passion. But they were talking about earlier about Newcastle and how they play and how people have adapted to them. They they just run at you. They just go, 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 and you can't handle it. Hmm. It's like uh, peak Klopp's Liverpool in the early days, isn't it? We've been saying Same this. Shape. Yeah. They prevented United from... Not that United are particularly good at it because, you know, De Gea and... I, I love Varane, but you know what I mean? He's not quite John Stones with the ball. It's uh, every time De Gea would pass the ball out to Martinez, they all looked kind of just shocked into paralysis and uh, when, you know you, when you've got like Jacob Murphy and Isak just <laughs> running at you like it, United were just frozen and basically couldn't play through them at all well did you see um, Alan Shearer did a bit of I think it was Shearer it might have been Danny Murphy did an analysis on match of the day two on Sunday night and they pointed out like we know De Gea is not very good at playing out from the back or he doesn't trust himself to do it. And so they were setting up a lot of times in this game to play out from the back and then he was just launching it. And Varane, you can see, is getting frustrated with them because they've been told to try and do this, but Newcastle are pressing so high with that narrow three to stop them doing it. Uh, this is not on our list of things to talk about, but De Gea is a thing that they're going to have to deal with at some point. Yeah, it is. Announced this week that they're trying to renew, or ha he has renewed, that there's certainly a, a long way towards is renewing. On, is it going to be on reduced it's, wages? Yeah, yeah, so the big question, I think, is whether or not they're going to bring in a starting keeper and keep him as a backup keeper. But if they're still playing De Gea next season, I, th I just think I can't see them having a better season than they've had this season. Yeah. I, feel I, I think we should explain like why this, like, exactly why this works, because it's to do with like having an extra player and build-up, right? So then a lot of teams will use the goalkeeper as an extra player. So... If you have 11 players, the goalkeeper is one of them. He can help, obviously, play it from the back, but it means you can play under pressure and play through presses is one of the reasons why. And with like that's the thing Ten Hag wants to do, right? Yeah, and they're struggling with ball progression anyway at the, at the moment, Manchester United. So it's, it's, it's worth saying that we shouldn't, we're not just um, singling out David De Gea. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned Varane. Varane isn't, I don't think Varane is particularly good under a huge amount of pressure in build-up, for example. And a lot of teams like to try and funnel their presses so that the ball ends up with him. Um, and again, at the moment, Manchester United have, have lost um, Christian Eriksen, which I think is really affecting their progression through the middle as well. But it seems to be the case that, that um, in certain games against certain teams, 
Eric Ten Hag wants his team to try and build up from the back. And we saw um, the, the Leeds United game. So there was two Leeds games in a row because there was a cancellation. So they ended up playing us twice in the league. And in both of those games, Ten Hag was, was trying to get his team to build up through the Leeds press. And obviously Leeds, Leeds are good at pressing and they really struggled in both of those games to, to get anything out of it. And I think this is a problem because when you're a team like Manchester United, you need to be able to repeatedly move the ball down the field, progress the ball into areas where you can then generate chances. Like it's, it's, not, it's not rocket science and, and they're not able to do that at the moment. And that, that starts with, as you say, David De Gea. He's important because every build up from the back is going to start with your keeper pretty much every time. Um, and so, yeah, if, you, if your keeper isn't on it, then it, it holds you back a, a, a massively. I and I think we see that specifically in this game because De Gea's launching it and then what you've got is a midfield two is it McTominay and Casemiro are playing as the well against Newcastle yeah no, Casemiro wasn't Sab- Sorry. Sabitzer and Bruno and That's then McTominay I mean. started ahead of them. Yeah, yeah I meant to yeah. say it was uh, McTominay and Sabitzer because they're missing Casemiro and Eriksen yeah. Yeah. and with those two players missing it changes the entire way it functions and you can see there was a, a split between like Bruno Fernandes was often dropping deep to try and be a link player they were using him to try and progress the ball yeah and keeping McTominay forward and presumably because all wrong. Like, Eric Ten Hag had watched Scotland yeah. <laughs> play in the international and thought oh he's Frank Lampard now we'll play <laughs> him up there yeah, well he's breaking he's breaking from deep in that Scotland game he's still I mean box <sighs> arriving box arriving A box yeah. arriving yeah. yeah it's the thing so like you can see the difference of having those players like Casemiro and, and Eriksen's made enormously even from that very first phase of build up play it changes everything they're, they're kind of doing there and without them they're a different team and it makes De Gea look worse it makes Varane look worse but they don't have those players there but with De Gea you can't play the way you want to anyway but then United now we should talk about Newcastle in a bit but just stay on United for a second they haven't won or scored a goal in their last three Premier League games um and basically, since they won the League Cup, they haven't been quite the same team. And they were sketchy in that game. I remember getting panned for saying it, but we saw much of the same problems that they had in that game in, in this game as well. And they've really sort of plummeted a little bit uh, recently. So, Do you feel you've got redemption now? No, I, I, I don't. But I, I do feel as though it's, it's become very obvious why I was saying that. I feel as though it's a long way for, for Man United to, to go still because, the, you know, they lose a couple of key players and they have these problems anyway in build-up. And suddenly they go from being a team where you feel as though they're going to win all of their games to a team where you can't see where their next win's coming from. And I think a lot of that, again, is to do with when you are a team at the, at the elite level, you need to be able to control games in, in different ways and I feel as though Manchester United just don't have the ability to do that at the moment um, it'll be a busy summer for them because they are going to have to bring in players who can can improve the the, the floor of players that they have but um, yeah the, at the moment it's it's it I mean they're looking like they could easily drop out of the top four even when we were talking about title races like not a month ago so uh, a lot it happened really happened. quickly there didn't mm. it yeah on uh, on De Gea did you see this uh, interview that popped up uh, from Bastian Schweinsteiger who remember when he played for Man United? That was <laughs> disappointing. Um, he said that David De Gea went up to him in training and said, "Am I better than Manuel Neuer?" And Bastian Schweinsteiger just said, "No, obviously not." <laughs> and then every time he had a good game, he'd go over to him and say, "What about now? Am I better than Manuel Neuer?" And he said, "Still no, obviously." <laughs> um, and he was he was right. It's brutal, but it's he true. just wants love as well. We all Don't need we all? love. Um, <laughs> uh, sorry, De Gea has not signed a new contract yet, apparently. But blah 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 blah. Newcastle, they're so good sometimes. Like when they play like this, it's really good, and a lot of it's tactical. But honestly, I think some of it is just kind of th- passion. Energy, passion. It Hashtag is. passion. Well, it's, the atmosphere was so loud when it, even on the TV you could tell like they're really up for this. Partly because of who they're playing against, and they had that little dip, didn't they, where they kind of became a little bit less cutting edge in attack. Um, and it's slightly leakier and now they seem to be back to their best where they have that that back five that you know you did that video about when they play they're really solid um, but even like they were missing Joe Linton like Almiron wasn't starting but they just seemed really up for it and now they've got a fit Isak up front and he's, yeah, he's just huge lovely isn't he? isn't he yeah he's a great player I think again with Newcastle it, it's very much a tactical fit thing where there's going to be certain teams who are going to try and build up from the back and it really suits them for because they know that they can they can press them. Whereas I think what we're seeing the team the games where they're struggling is when teams are like we're not even going to bother trying to build through you. We'll just go long and we take out a big part of your actual goal creation strategy. So yeah, I think a goal a game against Manchester United trying to build up but not particularly good at it is like the perfect uh, conditions for them. So um, yeah, I think Isaac was just incredible. Um, just 
everything that you want from a striker in that kind of system like out of possession really really good ran the whole game didn't didn't stop running the whole time smart smart pressing forcing um, the, the opposition into wide areas but then his hold up play incredible looked really dangerous as well as a goal threat um, and was was fundamental in that first goal as well so yeah really really nice really nice player and it's nice to see him doing well because I think people were you know a little bit like oh mm. you know foreign players come in and not done that well but it's great, great to see I, I really enjoy players. watching uh, Anthony play against Dan Byrne well <laughs> I was going to point this it's out it's like right? that Valbuena Fellaini <laughs> yeah. United kept going long like we are talking about um, a minute ago and Newcastle like their, their, squat, their recruitment the way they've built these players they've got big lads like they're really physically imposing uh, and so Anthony's never winning a header against Dan Byrne. And Ten Hag was saying, like before I said, that uh, the teams did not perform the way it should. They didn't have, they didn't want it as much. They weren't determined. And I think you saw it in Newcastle's speed of thought and actual speed of play. They were just going, 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 like full on acceleration to 100 miles an hour from go. But when the ball went long, they were competing for everything, knowing they were going to win. They kind of bullied them a little bit. And United don't have those kind of players. They have what you might think are better technical players, but mm. that's not enough to really... It's and interesting. It was interesting that Ten Hag went with with Weghorst up front and then McTominay behind him because it felt as though they were going to try and be quite aggressive out of possession as well. I I feel as though that that option is usually Weghorst drops back and Rashford plays on, on the line yeah. of last man, whereas it felt as though he wanted extra physicality in the middle with those two players. He's played McTominay there a couple of times now in that sort of not ten role, but yeah, yeah, like the more like advanced eight rushing one. in, yeah, yeah, where you get him out of the way for the build up and then yeah, because that's not his strongest point, is it? Mm. But he's just he's kind of been unfairly placed there. Um, and therefore got a lot of stick from McTominay. When he plays really deep and they're kind of asking him to be like a build-up number six kind of guy and he mm. just doesn't quite... He's not that kind of player. That, no. I think he gets... Uh, McTominay's just a funny one. Like He's played centre-back for Scotland quite a lot as well, but he's not a centre-back either. I don't know what... But, but the reason he is. was quite good in that back three now is because he could uh, progress the ball through that right channel. Like he carry progresses it. by carrying it, yeah. 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 I, I, like there's so many times I've seen him play for Scotland that not so many, but there's a lot of times we play for there where you can see to split decisions that he's not quite sure about, and it has a real effect, like a knock-on effect to other people in that team. It, it doesn't work there. He's like an old-fashioned box-to-box number eight in a four-four-two kind of, isn't he? Like he just kind of maybe he was maybe he's playing 15 years too late. <laughs> or maybe he just needs to play for a slightly worse club. Like I think the fact that he plays for Manchester United is like people expect him to, like the base level of good is a lot higher. So if he played for, uh, I don't know, at West Ham next to Rice, everyone would be like, pretty good. Yeah. I mean, Mourinho loved him, didn't he, when he was there? And... Mourinho used him as a political pawn to say, I need more players. When that was, that was the reason he got brought into the team, IMO. <laughs> Mm. Oh, I like it. Saucy! <laughs> Don't know why I said that either. I'm having a weird day. Seagulls can eat up to 20% of its body weight in food each day. So... They love chips. Depends how heavy the pie was, I suppose. Eat the, the whole thing? I don't know. Gulls can detect food from over three miles away. That's good. How? Uh, they just sit there and be like, someone's eating a pie three miles away. Well, they can see it on GPS. They can uh, see right. where, the, where the shops are. And so they can get some crisps. They have an app. Seagulls. They, they just spread the word. They're like Brighton Beach, just constantly. <laughs> yeah, they share it. I mean, I know that. The, like, I know that the supermarket in Tooting has got food in it. That doesn't mean I can detect food from over eight miles away, does it? It doesn't say they can detect detect good food because if I, I wish I had that power right now where we work because there's not many great places to eat around here. It doesn't matter anyway. Seagulls have excellent memories. They can remember specific people's faces. And places where food has been hidden. They seem from to days be ago. very food centric. Yeah, they like food. Seagulls imagine imagine having the ability seagulls. to like sit in this room and be like, oh, I know there's a Mars bar exactly there in the other room. That must be a weird feeling. Would well, you be aware of all of the food around you for three miles? Like That's a, a lot. It's not of food. like a magical sense. It's just smell, no. It's yeah, like, like a dog. There's a lot I mean, it's smell. a long distance, don't get me wrong. Three, a three-mile radius around, around you, yeah, that's no, a lot of food. Yeah. How, do they just, they're, they're just like, there's loads of food everywhere. Too much too much variety. Surely they can't like smell all of directions. that food, like, yeah. Do I want a kebab or that pie? You know, <laughs> don't know. They also seem to love like takeaway food, don't they? It's because that's what they can steal from people in the street. Yeah, but if they had a I choice, what would they choose? The healthy vegan option <laughs> or the pie. Yeah, they love gr vegan sausage rolls from Greg's. Like. This is the kind of video content that we should be trying to to see what seagulls would prefer to eat if they had the choice. So just go. we should go out down the road and just stand with various food products in our hands and see which ones go first. Yeah, see what the seagull takes first. So is yeah. there many seagulls in London? I don't see no. many. 
you need. Do you reckon it would work with pigeons? Do pigeons have great food sense? AC Milan versus Napoli <laughs> in the quarter final, well, the quarter final preview of the Champions League, is it? They're playing each other? Yeah. They, uh, so Napoli have been absolutely brilliant this season, but they got battered 4 0 by AC Milan, John. Yeah, they did. And we've been talking about how this is actually a, a, an interesting matchup because Milan seem to play really well against Napoli every time they face them. Uh, for various reasons. I mean, AC Milan are very much a team who are about out of possession play and causing teams problems in 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 build up and that's what they did so well in this game um they they put napoli under a huge amount of pressure um when they've got players like sandro tonali and um ismail benacer in their in their central midfield those two are really really good out of possession players and um I'm getting really put off by, yeah, by Steve gonna... writing by a drum tumft on the... Steve um... has written, John has was by a drum tumft, <laughs> but we were at one hour. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but basically, yeah, this was this was Milan sitting deep, um, causing problems for Napoli in their build-up, and then having the ability to get Rafael Liao into into dangerous situations in transition. And Rafael Liao is, is just a massive big game player in those, these situations. He, he causes problems for teams, and that is why he is being so hard. Highly thought about across the manager, the managerial, the uh, the transfer market. This this, this good. well, this another manager good, it? highly thought mm. of is Thomas Tuchel, <laughs> who took charge of Bayern Munich, and they. Uh, I mean, this is the thing with this league, right? Like oh, I, I did go. a video on Bristol recently. Here we go, and I was like, this could be a really good game, and they're one 0 up in a minute. Well, you know, through, a, through a horrendous. Oh, that was hilarious. Yeah, to be fair. it's really very. Uh, it's um, the poor goalkeeper just completely swings at the ball, and misses it. It's if, if you're Leroy Sane in that situation, do you whack the ball into net or let yeah, it run? I, 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 thought, yeah, he thought, I thought about he this. He was a going lot. to, yeah. and I think he was going to, and then thought, on the off chance I'm off, I'm going to leave it. <laughs> I thought a smart play that. Yeah, smart play. Yeah, but the score was Bayern four, Borussia Dortmund two, so that means Bayern have won the league again. Uh, it, it was given as an own goal that. Is that, is that did the keeper like must have clipped very, his boot? Or, but even still, like if it, I I always thought the, it was if it's on yeah. target and then it was a centre back that passed out, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it was a Pumacano. He just yeah. basically played a through ball to Zane and and it. And oh, that's harsh. Even if he's clipped it a little bit, it shouldn't count as no. Yeah. If it's on target, yeah, yeah. Mm. And that seemed to, I mean, that seemed to cause them a, a bit of a head loss uh, because obviously it's a massive game when you're top of the league. And their heads came off. Their heads, their heads very much came off. Um, and uh, they gave away a couple of goals in fairly quick succession after that. And it was a shame, really, because I think you... I always want to go into these games thinking, oh, let's have a really tight tactical affair and, and have a narrow win, but 3-0 by half-time, 4-0 soon after half-time. A couple time, of extremely then... Thomas Muller goals as well. Yeah. The yeah. Mullerist of goals you've yeah. ever seen. One where he sort of like... He just like kind of thighed it, in. Thigh it yeah. in there at the back post and then just kind of stood there and went... <laughs> well, was there? We, we've talked an awful lot, but is there a difference you saw straight away in what Tuchel's doing at Bayern compared to what Nagelsmann was doing? I mean, it wasn't a huge difference for me. I think he it was very it was a very solid sort of four two three one. I think it was it was smart in that it was out of possession. I felt like it was um, it was a very basic press, but it was. Um, he, it was a four two three. It was a, basically a four four two out of possession press, but with certain buffers in the central space. Because I think uh, Dortmund are very good uh, in terms of flexibility in the central space. They're, they're dropping Emery Chan, who's nominally a defensive midfielder, into the back line to make a three, pushing their their wide players up. And then there's a lot of fluidity with with Jude Bellingham. They played Rafael Guerrero in the, in the centre as well. But then you've got Julian Brandt, who's just like floating around. You've got Marco Royce as well. Um, again, another player who's quite flexible. So I think that in in Tuchel's head, it was like let's do a basic press, but let's have um, certain certain um, safety valves, I guess you might call them, to make sure that they can't just over overload us in the middle. So um, it was just basic basic football, but then um, largely what you would expect from Bayern. It, it was quite like Hansi Flick's Bayern, which is what Julian Nagelsmann did last season and then moved away from it this season so I think it was just a case of go go back to basics make sure that you're um, you, you're not going to roll over and, and rely on the fact you've probably got the better players uh, at the end of the day and it worked out for him Is it interesting that he didn't start Musiala because obviously he switched to a back four so they playing one more defender and he was the more attacking player to drop out for, for Pavard I suppose Yeah I don't I don't know the ins and outs of, uh, of the, the selection process but um, yeah I wonder I wonder why that was the I case. Suppose, Maybe because Kimmich and Goretzka work really well as a pair, and Muller is Thomas Muller. But he went with like, oh, there's no space for he him. went with Coman and Sane as well, yeah. who are sort of more wingery wingers yeah. than, than maybe Nagelsmann would have gone for. And I think once you do that, you're probably not going to play Musiala as a ten. 
um, behind behind um, Thomas Muller. So, yeah. but they went with Chopper Moting as well. So for me, it was just sort of like he he was he wanted to just have a solid four two three one shape. Um, basic stuff. And I know that Kimmich came out afterwards and said this win was as much about what Julian Nagelsmann um, did for us as, as what Thomas Tuchel did for us as well. But um, I, I, don't th I also don't think we're going to see much of what Thomas Tuchel actually wants this team to look like for a few weeks anyway. Um, especially this game was just be solid, rely on the fact you've got elite players and, and you know, fortunately for them, it, it was sort of handed to them on a plate, really. So. It feels like a placeholder system a little bit, doesn't it? Yeah. It's like, you all know how to play this shape. You're all good. You all fit in these round pegs and round holes. Off you They've go. They've all played in a 4 2 3 one before. It's, it's the Bayern way. Yeah. It makes perfect sense. And a, a nice way to round up everything is if you think about what um, Tuchel's done there and played a, a, a shape that absolutely suits some of their best players to get more out of them in a huge game compared to what Graham Potter has been doing at Chelsea mm -hmm. and just trying to mishmash them all together in a thing that he wants to do which isn't quite really clear not really a holding thing was he trying to hold it all together don't know what he was doing it's done now but Tuchel lives on and shall fight for the Bundesliga title this year every year that he stays fight yes <laughs> yeah. or Stroll. you'll get some uh, angry emails okay well fine but they'll be in German, so it's fine. <laughs> and so I think that's probably enough for us. We've talked about all the football. It's all done. All so the football. We should all say goodbye. Time. Please say goodbye, Ruben. Goodbye. Please say goodbye, John. Goodbye, John. <laughs> way! Way! That's good. I like that. Well, thank you to producer Steve and producer Don. You're welcome. But also, thanks to you, because you have listened to this podcast. Uh, maybe you're new. If you are, that's great. If you're old, also fine. What do you prefer, John? Um, well, there's pros and cons to both. I quite enjoyed being. Do you young. like our loyal fan base, or the, do you oh, only right. want growth? The legacy fans. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, They're listening. <laughs> I feel on the spot here. We love all the viewers and listeners equally. I, I hate all of the viewers and listeners. And what equally. about the evil ones? Some of our listeners. Ruben loves the evil. Will ones, be evil. Yeah. Where'd you get that from? You just said it. You, you love all of them. Uh, that's true. Yeah, I didn't. I mean, I don't think any of them are evil. So, oh right, okay. Good well, save. They, well, they were Good nice save. to me last time, and I hope they're nice to me this time. Yeah, be nice to Ruben. You can be mean about me. Everyone, everyone is, but be nice to Ruben. <laughs> that's so time. sad. <laughs> Next week, Joe will be here, and the pod will come out a day later because it's Easter, and that means, as I understand it, a giant magical rabbit will <laughs> pop out of a sack. Yeah, come out the sack and won't let us into the office that day. So that's there. I don't know if that's evil either, but that's what we've got. So thank you, listeners and viewers. Goodbye.